You're listening to Tapped In, Buckham County's Half Hour to Empower on WRES 100.7 FM in Asheville. Listen up and get tapped into local important resources, information, and topics. Learn more about the topics of today's show at buncombecounty.org. Okay, it's time to get tapped in. Hello, hello, hello. And greetings to all that are listening to my voice. And this is Tapped In. And I'm one of your hosts, Zakia Bell Rogers. And I'm Leonard Jones. Leonard and I come to you from the Communications and Public Engagement Department of Buckingham County. We are the heroes that wear a cape. <laughs> Today's episode is the fifth and the final of a five-part series that we've been doing about the Community Reparations Commission that is taking place here in Buckingham County in the city of Asheville. I would like to introduce our special guest today, Dion Greenlee Jones, Renata Conyers, and Ms. Norma Baines. They are here to discuss the work in progress of the Health and Wellness Impact Focus Area, a work group of the commission. Welcome, Dion, Renata, and Norma. Hello. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us here today. Well, before we get started, I would like to give some context behind um, this commission. Um, the Community Reparations Commission is empowered to make recommendations that will make significant progress towards repairing the damage caused by public and private systematic racism. The 25-member commission was appointed, appointments were made by the city and county government, impact focus areas, experts, and legacy neighborhoods. Those legacy neighborhoods are Burden Street, East End, East End Valley Street, Shiloh, South Side, Stumptown, and Asheville Housing Authority, and the Heart of Chestnut. The commission receives ongoing support from the city and county to ensure cohesion throughout. The commission is a two-year term, and this term should be ending between March and April of 2024. The impact focus areas are criminal justice, health and wellness, housing, education, and economic development. All right, so tell us, this is our first question, and anyone can answer. Um, tell us about yourself and why you joined the commission. Why y'all are looking at me? Oh. <laughs> So, my name is Renata Kyers, and I joined the commission because I work in public health and I've been in public health for most of my life for 30 something years and um, healthcare has always been a part of my life and it's always going to be around. That is something that is never going to go away. Mm -hmm. That is something that's never meant. And if, any, if you're ever out of job, get in healthcare. Sometimes it's time, time consuming, but it's well worth it mm -hmm. and I love it. Ms. Norma? My name is Norma Baines and I joined the commission because as a registered nurse I know how important health is and it's important to for all people to know how how health is and what we can do to stay healthy and I wanted to make sure that people understand uh, how reparations pay into our health also so uh, that is why I joined, and I hope people will understand uh, the health needs of African Americans and how we can better help better health care. Yeah. My name is Dion Lee Jones, and I'm excited and honored to be able to work with the commissioners. Um, I work full time in the space of health equity, where particularly with state pilots to help address inequities across the state. And so this was something that was just really exciting to be able to work with community members locally around disparities, around um, addressing harms done, and around health care needs in general for Buncombe County and beyond. So I'm just excited to be here with you all today and to share this space with these commissioners who are amazing. Mm -hmm. And so for the listeners, we know that the IFAs meet um, periodically through the month. So when do the um, health and wellness IFA meet and where and how often? We meet every other Tuesday um, at Stevens Lee. Okay. Stevens Lee's gym, if it's available from, we used to be 5.30 to 7, but now we are um, 6 to 7.30 and it's open to the public. Mm -hmm. So anybody that wants to come are welcome to come and sit and listen and join. I mean, they can sit and listen, not able to join in. Am I saying that wrong or right? No, no, no. Um, we are grateful though that we have commissioners, uh, uh, guests that come yes. and that are regulars. Mm -hmm. um, 
so the gallery as we call them come and while generally originally we understood that folks were to be observers because they had been attending uh, with us so long sometimes we do open it up for okay. feedback and conversations I think the commissioners were very deliberate here when we were looking at scheduling where to have our meetings and we want it to be accessible and in the community mm -hmm. another reason for Stevens Lee right. being the location yeah and it's very convenient and easy so like she says we have our regular attendees so, which is good okay so you know you have your regular attendees and this is a way the community can be involved um, indirectly mm -hmm. but you know get their footprints out there so how does this um, you know work with connecting to the larger reparations group um, as a whole well one of the things that we know we have IFAs in other areas mm -hmm. what's been exciting to see is that there's a lot of overlap mm -hmm. with what um, the commissioners envision as needs when it comes to discussing re reparations, greater conversations. So the fact that when we're concentrating initially in health and wellness, mm -hmm. it wasn't unusual though to bring up an issue around housing. Yeah. It wasn't unusual to bring up, you know, what are the needs of those that have been um, incarcerated and are coming back and re-entry and what are their health needs. So we're looking at some intersections so it's allowed us with other IFAs to attend some of those meetings and have um, cohesive conversations about overall what reparations means mm -hmm. and how it's much broader than our IFA. Yeah. And you said that there's an overlap and I think people when they think of health and wellness they think physical. Mm -hmm. um, are your, your body parts moving? Are you able to stand up? But there are so many levels to health and wellness. So what are some things that have stood out to you all? Um, while diving into the health and wellness part? Well, mental health is very important and in all aspects, you know, that we have. In your housing, economics, mm -hmm. all this plays on your mental health. So when you put all those things together, it's all important. Mm -hmm. If you are healthy within your mind, your body, then you can better function as a person and help your community. And it's a great point to talk about what health means because mm -hmm. now it's convenient the jargon is social drivers or social determinants of health. We know that that's the 80% outside of the 20% of physical health, mm -hmm. but again, your housing needs, your education needs, all of these other things that, as Ms. Norma indicated, make you healthy is beyond just the physical health needs, but those social drivers that help address you being healthy as a whole person mm -hmm. um, and, and the intersection between all of the IFAs has really brought that to our attention. And you mentioned social drivers. What exactly are social drivers? How does this mean? Again, social drivers of health are all of those things outside that people often don't think about as contributors to a person's mm -hmm. whole health. Mm -hmm. So again, technically the statistic is that you look at 20% of one's physical health mm -hmm. needs, the other 80% housing, education, healthy food, all of those things that would help you. I mean, just to think about it, transportation. If you don't have transportation to get to your doctor's appointments or your medical appointments, then how does that impact your overall health? Mm -hmm. So these drivers are really important for us to think about. It's not just about the physical health, your mental health, the status, um, how your children are doing, mm -hmm. all of those other things outside of your physical health are what we associate with social determinants or social drivers of health. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, also, uh, and also as a social, a social driver, it's like, you know, medicine and stuff, but also socializing with other people. Mm -hmm. If someone is way out in the country, and they don't have anybody around them to socialize with, that's another thing, you know, you know, trying to get them closer to somebody mm -hmm. that they can talk to, go to, you know, if they need help and stuff, because, you know, nine times out of ten you know if you're by yourself mental health is really you know mental health is really bad it's really really going down and you know mm -hmm. as you can saw we standing outside talking about somebody walking by and stuff and everything and so mental health is another thing that's not going to go away because we know we need we need socialization as um 
as we never had before. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly following COVID. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, and I want to say we can still blame COVID, but we can't really blame COVID. So you know, <laughs> we can't. So we have to try to come out of that mode and try to we we can blame COVID some. So it's kind of like a 50-50. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So. Yeah, but you know, COVID changed the dynamics of how you yeah. interact. Yes. 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 Miss Miss Norma has something. Yeah, I was going to say it's very important when it comes to seniors. So so many seniors live alone. Oh yeah. You know, yes. and isolation it works on your mental health. And I'm very happy to say that Shallow has a lot of activities for seniors, so mm -hmm. they can get out and interact with each other. And the nutrition program that we have. So this is all part of mental health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We all need this, and. Uh, of course, as a senior, I know that the seniors need it. And so we know with the reparation conversation, especially around health and wellness, uh, we have mentioned here around mental health, what are some of the other um, harms that have come to light during our research or over the past year that y'all want to try to address around? Well, issue? we are keenly aware of um, the lack of access to health care. Mm -hmm. We also understand historically, um, it, at certain points when you talked about the number of hospital beds mm -hmm. for African-American patients, you had very few of them. Yeah. So even when emergencies happened, there were certain mm -hmm. hospitals you could possibly go to or health centers, and then there were others that just didn't have beds for mm -hmm. us. So those kind of things are really coming to light. The lack of African-American doctors and practitioners, and we know we talk often about the exodus of many medical professionals mm -hmm. who might short term come to the area but then leave. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at the numbers of um, practitioners who historically were here and the fact that there are even fewer here now. Mm -hmm. um, it's really pretty disturbing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, I, I remember um, hearing some older folks talk um, at one of the reparations meeting and I can't remember what, they, or what the, the main topic was. But one of them said that they used to get their teeth pulled by veterinarians because mm -hmm. um, they didn't have access to dental mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, how does that play on like families ac just accessing? Because people don't understand like that's a part of health and wellness. And a lot of times we'll go with tooth pain and go to the emergency room mm -hmm. because we don't have an established dentist because, you know, how does that also play into all of this as well? Well, some of the services have been, and historically have been cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. So if you couple that with the lack of dentists who are actually seeing African Americans, if you couple that with the fact that, you know, that people, they are, if we're in rural Western, we're in rural North Carolina. So how could you even travel to a place that would have mm -hmm. practitioners who would see you? All of these are barriers, or were barriers, and continue to be barriers. When we talk about also, Ms. Norma um, was amazing in talking about one of our recommendations about no cost, or mm -hmm. how can we look at the accessibility to care when so many services are even today still expensive. Imagine how they were historically. So mm -hmm. we've had to try to do this journey back in time to see what the challenges were, and unfortunately, a lot of those challenges are still today. One of the things, and we've all talked about years ago when they were midwives, and mm -hmm. and I, my grandmother was a midwife, and a lot of people used to come to her and bring their children, you know, when they were sick. Mm -hmm. So that was some of the ways that they got their medical care, really. Uh, by the elders in, in the community and the midwives. She also worked with Dr. Hope, which was uh, one of the Afro-American doctors that was here in Asheville. And, and I had gone with her many times because I wasn't in the same room with her when she delivered babies. But I got to meet a lot of people that way and, and realized, you know, as I got older, what was really going on. Mm -hmm. They couldn't go to the hospital, so they had their baby at home and they needed the midwife mm -hmm. to do that. Oh, wow. With some of the, what's some of the recommendations y'all been kind of thinking about or discussing? Um, as 
the recommendation was, because um, we discussed this last night about in our main top four was um, the one, the no cost, um, mm -hmm. and the what lost, uh, payment lost, mm -hmm. payment lost, one at no cost, payment lost, uh, funding for mental health. And accountability. Accountability. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about accountability, what roles um, did city, county, county, institutional structures play in, in the barriers mm -hmm. to access to health? Um, and, and we've had the opportunity to hear from Dr. Sharon West about historical um, centers of health that no longer, many of them no longer exist. Um, the fact that organizations didn't get the kind of subsidies or, or support, um, fiscal support to continue. Um, all of these impacted the historical health of many of our friends and neighbors and fellow African Americans and continue sometimes today. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's kind of sad the fact that we're in 2023 and it's still, we're still having these same types of fights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, you were saying the African American hospitals and things of that nature. I did not realize, because I'm, I'm not a native, like a lot of you all are, and when I moved here, um, it wasn't a hospital anymore. It was a, um, yeah. I think yeah, it was a funeral home. Mm -hmm. And that, Jesse Ray. Yeah, Jesse Ray funeral home, but that was the hospital for people of color, or they call it the colored hospital. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed. And and I think just like to see it and like, you know, being at that time being a, a kid and understanding, oh wow, like this is the hospital that people who look like me could only go to and work at and see all these things. And it, you know, it was really sad when they tore it down and made it into a parking lot. But I think it is so um, amazing that, you know, that even at that time, there was such a thing as a hospital for us. Um, so that we could, you know, it may not have been um, top notch like the other hospital, but they were doing all they could to help the community. And I, I think, you know, we forget mm -hmm. those things as well because they disappear. It speaks to the resiliency mm -hmm. of our people. Yeah. Well, going back on what you said, I kind of wish when I moved here too, because I'm not a native too, so I'm, I'm still a visitor. I call myself a visitor, been here over 40 something years. <laughs> but I, but I, I call myself a visitor, so that when I moved here, it was Ray, uh, Jesse, Ray and Allen's, yeah. it was Jesse, then it went to Ray and Allen's funeral home. And it would be like, if there could be pictures, you can find what it was like on the inside before it became mm -hmm. a funeral home when it was a hospital. Yeah. Cause, um, we had Sharon come, like she said, we had Sharon come to our, um, as a guest speaker, and she was giving us information on stuff on the hospital and mm -hmm. where people can go and everything. And it's been nice to see pictures. I don't know, maybe that's if we could see what it was looked like before. Mm -hmm. Then it became a, a Eugene Ellison's yes, yeah. attorney mm -hmm. office, and then that was it. Yeah, so. Well, I like to say I was a patient there, so I have a <laughs> memory of that. <laughs> uh, I remember having my tonsils removed and my grandfather being there with me, you know, and he sit by my bed all night. I can still vision it and he made sure I was okay. Oh. But I was a patient there, so that is one of my memories mm -hmm. of the hospital is being there. And I know y'all mentioned um, Dr. Sharon West has come out. Who have been some other community members have come and shared information with our IFA work group? Well, we've had um, some community events where we were in partnership with the Racial Justice Coalition and other entities mm -hmm. where we were able to, and it was the first one back mm -hmm. in February, and we were excited to propose this for um, when we heard a lot of concern that there wasn't enough community engagement. Mm -hmm. So that gave us an opportunity to have people from all over Bond okay. County and actually from beyond come okay. and sit and talk about this. But we've also had attorneys from the city come. Um, we're looking at how we can partner with other IFAs as they continue to also try to innovate. You know, this process is still ongoing. So the, as much information as we can get from experts in the field, we're excited about that. Mm -hmm. and mind you, that even though this is eight, 
towards the end of March or April, it'll eventually still be a continuing thing. Because stuff like this will never end. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. So just with your experience, what's been some of the challenges or barriers you know, experienced in just this process? It's been a year long process. We know we building a plane as we fly it. So just share with the community, what's been some of the challenges? This reminder, would you like to start with this one? <laughs> <laughs> well, you really want to know? <laughs> so, and I, and I know this is a lot of, this is a pet peeve of mine, and, and I've heard other people say this, if this is supposed to be a reparations thing for African Americans, and the thing is, why do we have to change the name? Why do we have to change the name? And that's, you know, we shouldn't have to change the name that is meant for us to have just to please someone other, someone else. Because in, I don't know if you want to say it's for the funding or whatever, because everything has to do with funding. Mm -hmm. So, um, if we can't name it African, if it can't be named African American for reparations, then what then what are we supposed to name it? Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of conversation about that. Mm -hmm. um, yes. The fact that should you use instead of African American reparations for the African American community, mm -hmm. should you use um, for marginalized or for underrepresented? And there's the thought on one hand that it will be easier to get funding, mm -hmm. it'll be easier for a reparation to pass. Mm -hmm. And because of also federal restrictions now, but many of the commissioners were like, but wait a minute, it was all about um, African Americans being disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. Why can't you be honest and truthful about that and say that versus you know, marginalized or any of the other jargon that's used mm -hmm. where African Americans be who have been traumatized by this could be yeah. um, embedded in that. And, and that's that's troubling for many commissioners. Mm -hmm. And another thing is that if we change it, it's like, don't think the fund is gonna go where it's supposed to go. Mm -hmm. So, and that, that's, that's another thing. Uh, changing a name to suffice someone else so the money can supposedly go where it needs to go, which I personally don't think it might not go if we end up changing it. Because if mm -hmm. we can't leave it like it is and we have to change it to a mark, it's not gonna go where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna be back to square one again. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I truly believe we should say it like it should be. Mm -hmm. And of course, the United States have given reparation to so many mm -hmm. other groups and they said it like it was supposed to be said. Well, what's wrong with saying it now? Mm -hmm. uh, we are Afro-Americans. We, our ancestors endured so much, mm -hmm. so much. The harm is there. And even uh, we are still have the DNA mm -hmm. from the, from what happened to them that have, that's why we have all these ailments and everything else. So we need to say it like it is, and we need reparations for Afro-America or black people. Mm -hmm. And when we think about this, you know, even more than area, um, ever when you're hearing on a daily basis on television stations about changing the narrative mm -hmm. and whether or not um, African Americans truly endured trauma. I mean, it's ridiculous. And so this is another way of reinforcing Ms. Norval was right. We were able to see reparations um, given out to Native American groups, to Chinese Americans, to other groups, and we don't recall um, their ethnicities or racial backgrounds being changed, that nomenclature to address that. So, um, this has been an interesting process. Yeah. So here's an, uh, I wanna add that one of the other commenters wrote, and so she wrote, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, we have faced challenges in the course getting data requests submitted, completed in timely fashion, not just us, but of course other IFAs. And in fact, um, we're still waiting on a number of requests submitted months ago, last year. <laughs> also, as we, as a commission, as we, we as commissions have not been supported engaging with black communities in deep and meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. 
for Spike bringing this up. <coughs> Excuse me. Early in the process and given several possibilities how that could how this could happen. Mm -hmm. So um, this is another from another one of our members. Oh wow! I hate that we only have thirty minutes because there is so much more, so many more questions we can go through. But I am going to ask each one of you all to leave our listeners with something um, as we get ready to wrap up. And Miss Norma, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Well, I would want the listeners to remember that your health is very important and it affects all areas of your life. So stay healthy and hopefully we will keep doing what we have to do to make sure we get reparations. Mm -hmm. Ms. Well, this is an important process. Mm -hmm. um, if we are um, really looking at what the future holds, the fact that Asheville, Buncombe County is one of the few cities and uh, areas in the country addressing this directly. So it's a privilege to be working with this process. It has not always been easy, but um, it's important nonetheless. And so I'm just excited that we have a core group of commissioners that are just really devoted for us to address not just past harms, mm -hmm. but us moving forward to prevent future harms or the continuing harms from continuing to occur. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we just, I, I look at accountability for us, you know, accountability. And um, and then, you know, here, we, I'm going to, I'm also trying to include mine and the other our other IFA person. She wrote the process, and, you know, expect, Oppositions, you know, build community wide support, you know, um, define what reparation means in our in your local um, com community. And, you know, we just need to also define what really reparation means to us, you know, um, and, you know, work through it, you know, and, you know, make plans. So, um, <clears throat> Amy? And so I ended um, how I have over the past um, five recordings we did on this five-part series around reparations is that there is a need for community to support and rally around this commission um, to kind of give input, give feedback, but we can make the best decisions going for our community going forward. And so I would just like to remind people, um, if you're looking for more information around the Health and Wellness IFA, as they mentioned, they meet every other Tuesday from 6 to 7.30 p.m. And that's at the Stevens Lee Recreation Center. And I believe that physical address is 30 George Washington Carver Avenue. Um, and that's in Asheville, 28806. And so they meet every Tuesday from that 6.30 to 7.30. PM. However, the larger group also meet every third Monday at the Harris Cherokee um, Center downtown Asheville. And we just want to remind everyone that meeting is held at 6 p.m. at the Harris Cherokee Center. And also, um, a lot of these meetings have been recorded, especially the at-large meeting. And you can find that information if you visit the City Engagement Hub at publicinput.com backslash AVL reparations. And there you can find out, you can get caught up on what's happening with this initiative, view prior meetings, and um, allow, you a chance, allow you a chance to give feedback. So again, that address to visit the City Engagement Hub is at publicinput.com backslash AVL reparations. And you can find out more information. But again, I hope you enjoyed these um, five uh, recordings around reparation IFAs and uh, we strongly encourage community to participate. All right, you guys, and that was Professor Leonard Jones for our information. And you know how I wrap this up every time. Um, just recently, I bought a cake and thinking about that process, you know, for so long, we always take the easy route. You know, we go and we buy the box and all we have to do is add a couple of things to it here and there. Well, this process is like taking that box cake and putting it to the side and building a cake from scratch. You have to, you find out that it's very difficult. It's not just adding flour. You have to actually sift the flour. Um, it's not just about adding eggs. You actually have to um, put your wet ingredients together before you put your dry ingredients together. There are so many steps and so many processes and though you do everything you think absolutely perfect into the tea, 
that cake might not turn out right the first time. And so you try again and you try again. So you gotta ask yourself, what part of this cake are you willing to be? Are you willing to help sift through the issues so that we can have the best flour for the, um, the cake? Are you willing to crack open the hard documents and read through those like that egg and add it into the wet mix? Are you there to lend your strength when everybody else is tired and stir all those ingredients together until we come up with a plan? Or are you willing to stand there when it's hot in the heat from the oven and put that cake in there and make sure that it rises to perfection? We are all one bunkum. And at the end of the day, if one of us is suffering, all of us are suffering. If one tear falls from one eye, all our eyes are affected. We must understand that we are like trees in a forest, connected by roots, conversations, passing by, and people. So with that, get started on your cake from scratch, learn this community, engage with each other, and pour love into each other. You don't have to have everything in common to start a conversation. And until next time, You've been tapped in. Thank you for listening to Tapped In, Buncombe County's half hour to empower here on WRES 100.7 FM in Nashville. Learn more about today's topics at buncombecounty.org. Otherwise, stay tuned for more great episodes coming up. <laughs>